<laughs> How's everybody doing? Good? Well, I'm right, fine. <laughs> I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Man, it, uh, it's been a while since I've uh, preached. I don't... Sla- <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I... Uh, I opened up, uh, we use a software called Proclaim for our, our slideshow and everything, and I opened it up on my MacBook, and the, the last uh, presentation I had open was uh, the worship night from last year, November 18th. I don't think that's the last time I preached, though. I think I was using my work computer. <laughs> but it's been a while since I've used Proclaim regardless. So I'm really excited to be um, preaching, you, preaching to you guys today, and I hope... Uh, Hope that we get something from God's word today because God has certainly shaped my heart this week in preparation for this. But really quickly, let's go through a quick reminder and what happened last week. So we're going through the book of Ephesians and as Sonny said, you know, it might take us a year, it might take us four years, who knows? (laughs) We'll see how fast we go. Uh, Fortunately, these next two weeks, I'm taking care of a good chunk of uh, chapter two. In fact, we'll, we'll finish chapter two in these next two weeks. But last week, Sonny talked about just verse 10 of chapter 2, talking about how we were created by God for good works. It says that we are his masterpiece for good works in this world. And what I wanted to share with you today is just kind of the four landing points that Sonny uh, had, uh, had spoken to us last week. And first, our good works are for the glory of God. They're for his glory. In fact, Sonny said this last week, that if, that we cannot properly glorify God if we are glorifying ourselves. Or rather, God can't glorify himself through us if we try to pump ourselves up. In fact, our good works are for his glory. And, and somewhat that seems, if on face value, that might seem egotistical for the, the p- random person reading the word. But no, it's, it's because God deserves it. He deserves that our good works would give him glory. He deserves to be glorified through us for what he's done, for who he is, for his character, for creating the world, for sending his son to die for us and for raising him from the dead. We are to glorify God in all the good works that we do because if we are glorifying ourselves, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. Our good works are not for us It's for the glory of God. Sonny also pointed us to this. Our good works are to emanate Christ and the truth of his claims. Our good works are supposed to point people to the truth of Christ. Everything that Christ said was true. If you believe that, hopefully your good works eventually lead to those gospel conversations, those conversations about his truth, about the fact that Jesus would predict his death and then predict his resurrection, about the fact that Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody can come to the Father except through him. Hopefully, your good works are displaying Christ to the world so that they can see the truth of his claims. And that's kind of another point that Sonny help land us on last week. And also, our good works are supposed to bring God's loving touch to people. How many of you have ever had a good work done to you? (laughs) How many of you felt love when that good work was done to you? Let me tell you, it's not because of the love of that person. Hopefully, it's because of the love of God working through their heart. This is another purpose for our good works, Our good works are supposed to scatter the love of God to every heart that it reaches. Again, our good works are not for us. They're so that people can know the love of God. The love of God is supposed to touch those people that you do good things for. You might need some introspective thinking about how your good works are shaping your life. Are they shaping you so that you can get ahead? Are they shaping you so you could get on top? Or are they shaping you so that people can know God's love? That's the purpose of our good works. And the final thought, and one that will actually bring us pretty into our sermon here today, it's also to promote peace and order. Remember, Sonny brought in the Old Testament where God asked the Israelites to go into a foreign nation and not create war, right? 
even though they were going into a nation that was probably one of the biggest war powers in that time, they were probably the biggest tyrants, the most pagan people, the most people away from God. And yet, God tells the Israelites to go in there and bring peace and live out your life in peace and order. And that's what our good works are supposed to do as well. In fact, our good works should not keep people away from each other. They should bring people together. Our good works should provide peace. And this is especially prevalent prevalent for the Christians in the early church. Think about it. These people were put to death for their love of Jesus. These people did not live in a world of peace. They were put to death because they were Christians. These people would be thrown in jail because of their belief. And in fact, as we're going through Ephesians, Paul was writing this from prison. He's in prison writing this. And yet, they were called to give peace throughout the world. They were called to bring God's peace to people. And it's pretty cool that Sonny would use that point to kind of lead us here today. Paul would take this idea of good works and then begin to speak how, Christ, how through Christ making us new through us displaying good works is because we can be unified in Christ and begin to build a grace-filled community. That's another thing why good works are, are good for us here within these walls is because then we'll build a community that's found, foundationally put on grace in Jesus. And Paul does this through speaking about relationships and he's going to use peace within the relationship of the Jews and the Gentiles. So if you guys open your Bibles to Ephesians 2, we'll be in verse 11. Now, Jesus didn't just make us new creations. He made some new things as well. And here, we're going to talk about out with the old, in with the new. Out with the old, in with the new. And let's start with the old way, okay? Let's read chapter 2, 11 and 12. It says this. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You live in this world without God and without hope. Paul is starting to set up what he is going to talk to the Ephesians about in the upcoming verses. And he uses the sign of the Jews, the circumcision of God's people, as an illustration. The purpose in which Paul is writing this is to continue to frame the minds of the early Judeo-Christians. In fact, you see that potentially they're in their deepest hearts, they still didn't believe that Gentiles were co-heirs with Christ. They still didn't believe that Gentiles should be a part of the fold. They still believed that Gentiles were alienated. They weren't circumcised. The promises of God weren't sent down through their fathers to them. The great miracles that God had performed weren't usually for benefits of the Gentiles. They were, as the text says, alienated. And this is talking to us as well. If we lived during that time, we would be alienated. Huh, raise your hand if you're Jewish. <laughs> None of us can. So if we lived during that time, we were not part of the covenant of God. We were not part of his promises. We were not amongst the Jews. We weren't giving the promises of God. We were to be, we were too once alienated. And fortunately, the good thing about this is that this is the old way. This is not the current way in which God has his plan unfold, right? Thankfully, this is the old way. I'm reminded of Abraham's covenant with God. Abraham in Genesis would have this covenant that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. Now, I'm one to believe that I don't think that would just happen through the nation of Israel. I believe there was a spiritual component to that that through the shed blood of Christ, he would have descendants spiritually, brothers and sisters in Jesus. If it was just Jewish people, I don't know if that covenant would necessarily be fulfilled. And now I do see it fulfilled 
in us, even through Judeo-Christians now, now it is the new way. Let's read about the new way. The new way is this. In verse 13, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. There is now a new way that the things of God run. Now there is unity between the two people groups. Jews may no longer look at the Gentiles as people who are merely uncircumcised and not part of the fold, but rather they should now look at them as brothers and sisters united in Christ. And how did he do this? He gave all the ability to draw near to God through Christ's blood and his sacrifice. There was once a time where God's presence was tethered to a temple. There was once a time where only priests were thought of as people who were near to God. There was once a time where there was a room that only the high priest could go into once a year to offer up a sacrifice, to be close, to be near to God. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, unless there's a secret room in this church, I don't see a holy of holies. Is there, is, is there a secret room that only you and maybe the deacons can go in? No? What about that back room? Is, that's a scary back room. Is, <laughs> what about up the ladder? No, no. No, okay, you don't go there? So there might be a secret room. <laughs> but yeah, we, when we built this church, I don't know, 13 years, I wasn't here, 13 years ago? Okay, when we built this church, I don't think we had in the plans a holy of holies. <laughs> it's because it's different. There's a new way. In fact, there's a better way. There's no holy of holies in here where only Sonny can go into. In fact, through the power of prayer and through the power of God's word, we may draw near to him at any time during the day. You guys realize that? Any time. During your work day, during when I'm bringing Caleb to the, to the toilet every single five minutes to try to potty train him, I can talk to God. <laughs> in fact, sometimes we bring the guitar in the, in the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> And we sing, uh, he loves singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Um, uh, Or or I play some uh, music on the phone or something in the bathroom (laughs) while we're hanging out. It's amazing. It's amazing that God has decided not to tether himself to a building, not to tether himself to a holy of holies, but rather he tethered himself to your guys' heart. If you guys believe in Jesus, you got God right here. You got, God, you got God in your soul, in your body. That's amazing. Listen, once God came in the form of Jesus, he never wanted his nearness to be different. Never wanted it to be different. He wants to be among his people and he is now residing in the hearts of those believe, those who believe. Jesus came, he lived amongst his people, and now God wants to do that as well, and he does that. He's amongst our hearts. He's amongst us. And despite this message from Paul being specifically for the Gentiles, I believe that he wanted the Jews to understand it as well. You see, there are people who haven't been exposed to the gospel. There there are two people groups here potentially here within our walls, in this world. There are people who have not been exposed to the gospel, and some of you might be that group. And your encouragement today is that you have a God who sent his one and only son to die for you so that you may draw near to him, so that you could be close to the God of the universe. Guys, the God of the universe who created this world by the power of his words wants you to draw near to him. And you can. Jesus would say, I am the the way, the truth, and the life. He would also say, if you believe on me, you would have eternal life and you would be close to God. But there might be people here who have been around God for a long time. And those of you, at least in this story, at least what Paul's writing, I would equate to the Jews. 
They've been around God a long time. Maybe some of us within these walls have been around his presence, been around his church, been around his word, but you struggle to draw near to him. You find it hard to draw near to a God who might have given your life, who you might have given your life to, but still struggle with the fact that he isn't tangibly next to me. And maybe the encouragement to you is the same. The God of the universe chose to save you so you can draw near to him through his shed blood of Christ. Maybe you need to realize that again in your life. I know I've had to sometimes. Where I've had to realize that the big God upstairs is not only my father, but he wants to be near me. Sometimes I've had to realize that. But I, I sometimes think of the Pharisees in this scenario, and I, I'm not calling us Pharisees. I, I don't think we are. But rather, sometimes us Christians are so focused on doing the stuff of God rather than being focused on God. So focused on making sure that we keep whatever the Bible says. So focused that we try to do the things that the Bible tells us to do that we forget to draw near to our Savior, to our Father. Remember that he has created us, as Sonny said, anew in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works. And as James says, our faith should spur on our good works. We draw near to God so that we can continue to do good works. We draw near to God so that we could grow closer to him, so that we could understand that we must become a little bit more each day like Christ. We as Christians, I don't know, there's some Christians in here who've been Christians for 40 plus years. Do you have have struggles drawing near to God sometimes? And maybe you don't, and I'm so happy about that. I'm so glad about that. But sometimes we we can drift ourselves away from God as Christians. I do it all the time guys. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes during the week, I just don't go to my word. I just don't go in prayer just because maybe some other things are going on or maybe I'm just not in tune with God. And this week has been pretty prevalent to my, my heart that I must grow closer to him. And so maybe there is one way that we could draw closer to God. And I think Paul's going to touch on it here. As we grow closer in relationships, as we continue building a community of grace, we need to see peace in our life. We need to see peace. And there's multiple definitions to this word peace, at least Paul would be using here in our passage for today. And I want you guys to know that one of those definitions is going to help you draw near to God. It's going to help you. So let's move forward. This series is about building a grace-filled community and it flows from what Sonny has been talking about through good works and through faith in Christ. But I believe Paul is getting to something that drives that grace between us all, that pushes that grace between us all, a force that helps us live a grace-filled life. And yes, we can boil that down to, you know, just Christ himself, just, just having that force of the Holy Spirit within us Maybe that's something that can help us grow a grace-filled community. In fact, I know it can. But to get more specific, Paul is going to talk about the subject of peace and its impact not only on us as individuals, but us as people who are designed for relationships. And you'll see that throughout this passage, Paul is going to use the groups, the two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, and he's going to show us how a group that was so hostile towards one another can finally find peace. So let's read. 2.14 says this, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when, in his own body on the cross, He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. For Christ has brought us peace. He came to earth in order to reconcile his people back to him, but also to inform the Jews that his plan for redemption was not just for them, 
but for the Gentiles, offering peace between them and the alienated. But I think it is more than this. And in order to understand this a bit more, we do have to switch versions of the Bible. The NLT is very good for reading. It's very good for understanding some of the themes within the scriptures. But I want to show you the ESV because I think it's a little bit more powerful, at least for this. My emphasis is added. For he himself is our peace. For he himself. He did not just bring us peace. He is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus himself is our peace. He didn't just bring it. He is it. Christ himself is our peace. Jesus did not just walk this earth, but he inhabited it with every characteristic of God, meaning he was perfect in love. He was perfect in self-control. He was perfect in grace. He was perfect in truth, and he was perfect in peace. To exemplify true peace is to emanate Christ. I'll say that again. To exemplify, to display, to bring out true peace in this world, we need to emanate Christ. But even deeper still, this peace is not just being peaceful amongst one another. This peace is not about me just being nice to James, even though he ruffles my feathers sometimes. This peace is deeper than that still. Because the original Greek word for peace here conveys contentment. It speaks about contentment. From understanding that Christ is our contentment, that he truly is sufficient for our lives and for our community. As Paul is speaking about, contextually, he's speaking about unity. He's still bringing in the reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles as one in Christ. The walls of hostility have been broken down. How are they going to truly be reconciled between each other if they are not content in their Messiah? If they don't see Christ as their contentment? If they don't see Christ as enough? You guys, we as a church, we won't be peaceful amongst each other unless we are content in Christ. We won't be graceful amongst each other unless we realize that our goal as a church is Christ. Everything, everything. our mission statement, everything is about God. Everything is about Jesus. We won't be able to build a grace-filled community like Paul is encouraging us to do if we don't have contentment in Christ. If we don't have overwhelming peace that Jesus has got us, that Jesus, as the song said, will never let us go. Even further, if you remember some of the stories in Acts, Paul is trying to help the Ephesians understand that circumcision is no longer vital for salvation of God's people. It is instead the sufficient act of Christ on the cross. Paul is saying, you do not, Gentiles, you Gentiles, you don't have to do circumcision anymore. And all the Gentiles are like, woohoo! <laughs> we don't have to do anything physically in order to accept Christ as our Savior. Remember, it says it over here. You were called uncircumcised heathens. But then it says, but now you are united in Christ Jesus. No longer is it a function of physicality that you have to be a part of God's people. It is a matter of your heart. It is a matter of spirituality. Yeah, where was I? Over here. (laughs) This feeling of contentment also harkens back to 2.8. It says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Do we have peace in our salvation? Do we feel like we need to do stuff in order to receive God's love? Instead of being fully content in him who is our peace, who gives us that that love freely as a free gift. Paul just said it right here. For it is by grace through faith that you have been saved. You no longer have to do stuff. 
you no longer have to get circumcised. You no longer have to become a Jew. We can give our lives to God because he freely gave his life for us. Because if we truly have peace in Christ, who is our peace, then we can truly have a grace-filled community and one that also has another version of peace that Paul will be talking about here. And that's reconciliation. Bringing peace amongst our relationships. Paul would teach us this through the example of Gentiles and Jews. Let's read on. In Ephesians 2, 15 to 16, it says this. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. We find our peace with each other through Christ because two of the most separated people groups in all of history are now unified under Christ. We are, we, let's use that example, guys. These two groups did not like each other. <laughs> they didn't. And yet Christ, in all of his works on the cross and through his resurrection, was able to unify them. The Jews hated the Gentiles to the Jews, they were vile. They were dirty swine to them in Jesus' time. And naturally, Gentiles didn't like the Jews so much either. I mean, James, if you call me a dirty swine, I might not like you either. <laughs> Obviously, if the Jews hated the Gentiles, the Gentiles are going to hate the Jews. Makes sense. <clears throat> I'm going to open up the Bible. Sound good? <laughs> There's a very good story that Jesus would use to illustrate this hostility towards, uh, between the Jews and the, and the Gentiles. And if you think about it, it's a story that foreshadows what would come to be. So I want to read this to you, and if you want to follow along, it's ju I just have the reference on there. We're going to talk about the Good Samaritan here. I'll read it. It starts in uh, 1025. It says, One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Here's a story. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Jesus would say, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Why do I bring this story up? Because we're talking about reconciliation. We're talking about Jews and Gentiles hating each other, but now they're one. This story foreshadows exactly what Christ would do. He would, he would do, he would break down the walls of hostility between those two groups because he doesn't want people walking on the other side of the road when there's a person laying down hurt, almost dead by bandits. Unfortunately, that happens sometimes in our world now. 
The question that we have to ask ourselves is not only who our neighbor is, but is there something that is holding us back from truly being reconciled with one another? Remember, the priest, the temple assistant, they walked on the other side because that person was, was kind of grimy. That person was almost dead. I don't want to touch you. And yet, a Samaritan walks up. The despised Samaritan. The person that nobody, no Jew liked. In fact, Jesus is telling this story amongst Jews. He's saying, hey, the Samaritan is your neighbor. <laughs> There's, there should be no more walls between the Jews and the Samaritans, between the Jews and the Gentiles. Maybe there isn't hostility amongst the people within these walls here today. But what about in your pr- place of work? If there's a person from your work who is on the side of the road beaten, would you help them? I sure hope so. <laughs> But maybe there's that person that just grinds your gears. Maybe that person called you a dirty swine. I'm not going to help you. You called me a dirty swine. What about in your family? Is there hostility amongst your family? Does your family need some peace? Is there something holding you back from being reconciled? Because there was something holding them back the Jews and the Gentiles. It was stupid, (laughs) but there was something holding them back from reconciling the two to become unified. They weren't God's people. We don't like them. They're dirty swine. (laughs) Something holding the Jews back from being unified. Because here's the thing. Sometimes the things that split our relationships with people is just as petty as, oh, he is a Gentile. Oh, he is a Jew. You guys, Christ came to abolish all hostility. He came to reconcile. He came to bring two of the people groups that hated each other together. He came to unite all of humanity under him. Not just between the Jews and the Gentiles. There is a reason that Christ is our peace because he is also the perfect example of true love in our, li- true love in our life. That we can bring true love to the world so that all may be reconciled and united under Jesus. Isn't that amazing? I love that. I love that there are people like me who like Jesus and we're all unified. I love it. I love all you guys amongst this walls. You know, I I know some people from Trinity. I love them. They're cool. (laughs) We all like Jesus. Well, not all of us, unfortunately. (laughs) But we can all be unified under Christ. Isn't that amazing? To end, Paul would talk about the platform in which this peace is to be exemplified. And it's the platform of the gospel. It's the platform of the good news. Yes, Christ is our peace, but his story and his sacrifice is the platform in which that peace is showcased, in which that peace is talked about. Let's read it. Ephesians 2, 17, 18 says this. He brought this good news of peace to you, Gentiles, who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who are near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit, because of what Christ has done for us. Through what he preached, we may know his peace. Remember, we already talked about the Good Samaritan, but Christ also told us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to love our enemies, not to be angry with one another. And he died for us so that peace might be displayed. The gospel is the good news of God's peace. The gospel is the perfect peace treaty for us all. Think about the peace treaties that have happened in history. Did you know after World War I there was a peace treaty? Did you know there was a World War II? (laughs) Same countries practically too. Yeah, a new leader in World War II with Hitler and everything. But we were supposed to have peace after World War I between the world. (laughs) 
oh, and, and did you know there was a peace treaty signed after the war, the Civil War? <laughs> There was a peace treaty saying, and then there was the saying that the war would stop, and then there was the Emancipation Proclamation that slavery was to be abolished, right? Oh, yeah, have you heard of a guy called Martin Luther King Jr.? There still wasn't peace for African American people within this country. There still wasn't reconciliation. That Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> that's hard to say. The Emancipation Proclamation did not stop racism. It stopped slavery. <clears throat> there was still hostility. Did you know that Martin Luther King in his famous speech, the I Have a Dream speech, it was about a dream where peace would reign in the hearts of men. It was about a dream that one day his kids would not have to walk the streets and think they were going to get killed, beaten by cops. Isn't that prevalent for us today? We can have full peace through the preaching of the gospel. That was Martin Luther King's dream, that the gospel would reign. Read that transcript, guys. Read it. It's all about God. It's all about the Lord reigning over, over America. <clears throat> This preaching of the gospel is the peace. It's the platform of peace. It is not just simply speaking about it, though. It's also acting it out. It's also living peace. It's also having reconciliation within our relationships so that people can see that peace amongst us and then, in turn, see Christ, who is our peace, Christ, who is our contentment, who is our sufficiency, Unfortunately, we will not know true peace in this world because we are fallen humans and we're incapable of living out perfect peace. And not everyone knows Christ. You can't just, I mean, the random person down the road might not know Jesus. And so how are they going to be perfectly peaceful to you, right? But we have to try. And to encourage you guys, I want you to think and I want you to pray about one relationship. One, it starts with one. Think and pray about one relationship that you might have that's not peaceful, that's not reconciled, that's not loving. Think about that one relationship where you can maybe preach the gospel and bring peace to that. It's important that we understand our reason for preaching peace is because of what verse 18 says. All people, through Christ, have access to the Father by the Spirit of Christ. That's why we preach peace. That's why we try to bring peace to this world. And we want everybody to be unified for this purpose. We preach the, the peace of Christ because we want people to experience the peace of Christ. I want people to know God's peace. I want people to know that if they die tomorrow... They're content in their salvation. They're content in knowing that God's got them, that God will never let them go, that Jesus died once and for all for you. That's the type of peace that I want us to bring into this world. And true peace is found in the unity of the Spirit, the access to the Father, both by the sacrifice of the Son. Let's go. <laughs> it's hot in here. Are you guys hot? Oh my goodness. <laughs> anyway, thanks guys. Let's, uh, let's pray to God and let's just ask him to allow us to bring peace to this world uh, as he gives us peace. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for just the wonderful opportunity is to study your word and to, to, to glean guidance from it, to, uh, to understand more about your son and his sacrifice and his love for us but also, Lord, that, that we would understand that Jesus, we could be content in him, that he is enough, that he is our one and only sacrifice, that we no longer have to do anything else but emanate Christ in this life. Lord, as we believe in you, let us bring you and your peace to this world. 
And you know, we, we ask that you continue to draw near to us as we draw near to you. We ask you to give us strength to draw near to you. Sometimes we forget that you are there within your word. You're right there within our hearts in order to pray to you. Sometimes we forget that. Lord, I ask that, that we are reminded that you are near to us so that we can draw near to you. And that we are reminded to reconcile our relationships just like the Jews and Gentiles have. That we can all be united under Christ through the Spirit with access to the Father. We thank you for this. We ask that you bless the week ahead. Lord, give us a chance to share the gospel this week. Just bring those opportunities to us that we might be able to grant peace to other people through the preaching of your word, through, through loving them, through good works that glorify you and not us. We hope that things go smoothly this week with each of our relationships, that we are just offering peace amongst that as well. Lord, we ask that you guide us this week. Be in front of us, not behind. Let us follow you. Let us take the steps that you are taking so that we might be able to impact this world with your wonderful peace. It's in Jesus' name I pray.